Hi guys, welcome to the Archive. This week I've got a tutorial on how to build this awesome functional crane for D&D or wargaming like 40k or Necromunda. The really awesome thing about this project is it was dirt cheap. I mean seriously, this thing is mostly made out of cardboard and, well, in the original designs, hope. It's also actually really easy to build if you're just following the tutorial because most of it is literally just cut and stick. There's also a bunch of timestamps in the description so you can jump around to whichever section you need if you want to build it over a longer time period. You might have noticed I decided to go with a very industrial look for the crane and there is a solid reason for that. I could have easily made this out of balsa wood and in fact if you wanted to you could take the measurements and instead of cutting card just use balsa wood of the same dimensions. The reason I didn't was that making an iron crane gives it more flexibility in my eyes. A wooden crane doesn't look quite right in industrial sci-fi and post-apocalyptic settings like 40k or Necromunda, and it also doesn't really work if you wanted to include it in a Dwarven or Duragar forge, because, you know, wood and fire. Having it made of metal, on the other hand, it can still make sense for mundane settings in a fantasy universe. This isn't just a crane on the docks, this is a dwarven made crane imported by a wealthy company or city to add prestige and make loading and unloading faster and safer. Or whatever. Point is, this thing is not out of place and actually really helps ground your setting as a fantasy setting, not just, you know, medieval Europe. As for Necromunda and things like that, I went with the chains to kind of strike a balance between the sort of future, semi futuristic industrial and the fantasy because chains and stuff still kind of works for dwarves. I could have done hydraulics for Necromunda and 40k, I could have tried to figure out a way for that to work, but I think that's a step too far for the dwarves. So I tried to strike a balance somewhere in between that would allow it to still more or less work for both. I did, however, figure out a way to add a cover to this little wheel here, to the outside of it, so that it looks more like an engine for futuristic settings and things like that. You'll see what it's actually intended for if you haven't had much experience with medieval cranes um, later in the video. There are a ton of different ways you can use a piece like this in games, whether RPGs or war games, and most of them are the kind of movie moment scenes that players love. The mechanism itself is really easy to operate. To raise or lower the arm, you can just turn this front wheel. And to move the main chain, you just rotate this big main wheel. Spinning it around is as simple as pushing it gently, it moves really quite smoothly. From a D&D perspective, this could be used on a multi-layered city dock, in this case built using my wall and temple pieces, a tutorial for which you can find linked above or in the description, where the players are given the opportunity to do anything from dropping cargo on enemies' heads to leaping onto the platform and swinging it into a pile of enemies, or the villain's escape boat smashing the mast. Or it could be a long forgotten crane left in an abandoned dwarven mine deep in the mountains. Maybe this crane in particular has goblins or cobbles camped nearby, and the industrial little buggers are using the thing to help them continue what the dwarves left behind, or just drop things on adventurers. It could be a crucial component in a Duragar forge, moving searing hot materials from one area to another. The cargo platform is removable, so it could be easily replaced by a quick heavy forge... I don't know what you'd call it, bucket? Like the one Padme ends up in in Clone Wars. Maybe the characters can use this to move from one area of the forge to another without being detected. In wargaming, the piece becomes an interesting strategic cog. Place it right and controlling it could allow one of your gangers to move the platform into position to allow jumping across where it otherwise would have been too far, opening up new avenues of approach. Maybe there's some cargo on the platform which can be used as full cover while a second ganger moves the crane platform towards the enemy, allowing the Goliath champion to leap off and wreak havoc once close enough. If you like this video and want to see more, go quickly hit subscribe and the bell to catch me in future. This was going to be one of those projects where there was going to be a lot of cutting and sticking, so after I made sure the concept was going to work with a prototype section, I started cutting out all the pieces that I would need for the main build from thick card, which I think Americans call chipboard, in one go with some YouTube on in the background. 
Brent from Goobertown Hobbies is great for this. He's one of my go-tos for mini painting motivation, but when you need to zen out and do a lot of cutting and sticking, he's pretty great too. You'll need a range of measurements for each section, but it's all pretty straightforward. I'll include the measurements themselves with explanations when I get to each section, rather than reel them off in one long boring stream. But I've included a list in the corner here if you want to cut them all out in one go like me. Because we're making this from chipboard, you want to be careful with your cuts so you don't accidentally tear the cardboard. The good news here is that if you do, you can just cut another bit because all of the cutting is done before the gluing. So messing up a cut isn't going to ruin the project. That said, you can avoid it happening at all just by cutting with multiple light cuts rather than pushing on hard, and by using a sharp blade that you replace regularly when you start to feel it getting more resistance in the cut. You want to be a little careful when handling the pieces, and by a little I mean don't grab them like a pizza delivery you've been waiting over an hour for. You don't need to treat them like dainty princesses, just don't manhandle them in case you accidentally fray the edges. If you do accidentally fray the edges a little, you can fix it if it's not too severe just by squeezing the card on both sides with your nails gently and pulling along. If you do this before you seal it up with Mod Podge, it should still be fine. Once I had my pieces, it was just time to start gluing. I started with the bottom of the crane itself, with the base eye beams on each side. I took two 7 inch by 3 eighths of an inch pieces and laid them 2 inches apart. A cutting board with measurements on is useful here but you can just use a ruler at the gluing stage. A bit of blue tack under each piece helps to keep them from moving while you're working on them. From there I took the 7 inch by half an inch pieces, laid them on top and marked out half inch spaces in three places. One a quarter inch from the left on both sides, another straddling the three inch mark and another one and a quarter inches from the right. I then cut these chunks out a little wider than I'd measured to give me some leeway with the next pieces and then laid the remnants of the strips back down. I then made sure the middle strips were going to fit nicely by blue tacking them in place while I glued the rest. The two smaller strips of 2 and 7 eighths of an inch are placed on the outer edges and the longer 6 inch strip I put straddling the middle. Once those were in place and the beams were 2 inches apart in the middle and more importantly parallel, I glued the eye beam in place with some tacky glue. I used a manky old brush to make sure the glue was thinly spread and right up to the edge. You don't have to do this, but it does seem to help get a strong, even bond. When I was sure that they wouldn't move, I gently removed the blue tack and tacky glued the middle strips in place. When getting the leftover blue tack off, I found it was best to gently scrape it sideways with more blue tack, rather than dabbing the blue tack on it to pluck it up. That kind of helps avoid ripping the card. Then I sealed the whole thing up by gluing down the last two 7 inch by 3 eighths of an inch strips of the base eye beam before again gently removing it from the blue tack. Now the base was complete, I needed to make the structure for the mechanism. I wanted it to be sturdy, but also able to hide any layered chipboard to keep things looking right. I decided on more eye beams for this and made two of them, this time with four strips of chipboard layered on top of each other as a thick core, with a rounded top that I could drill into for the mechanism. I started with four strips of two inch tall, three eighths of an inch wide chipboard and tacky glued three of them together. I then drilled a four millimeter hole in, a quarter of an inch from the top to fit a barbecue skewer. Or more accurately, I drilled a 3mm hole in and then widened it because I couldn't find the right drill bit. I wanted the skewer to have room to rotate, so I pushed one in at this stage to make sure that it could move easily, before trimming the excess card off the sides. When drilling the hole, I found it was a good idea to drill a smaller 1mm guide hole first to make sure it stayed in the right place. Once I had that, I glued the final 2 inch strip on and drew a curve a quarter of an inch from the top which I then carefully cut off with an X-Acto knife. Getting this even is way more important than making it neat. The top of this piece is going to be covered up anyway. I then tacky glued the two one and a half inch tall, half inch wide enclosing pieces on the sides. and finally cut some serial card 
to fit over the top and hide the layered chipboard. It looks a little bit plain now, but I had plans to add some more detail to it later. Before gluing the I-beams down, I drilled through the final card on one side, because only one side of this needs to be fully enclosed, and then used a skewer to make sure that the pieces were lined up nicely. I decided to use super glue to glue it to the piece directly above the middle cross beam, because this is a core part of the crane that will probably be under the most strain, and I didn't want to take any chances. Next, I needed the winch mechanism, or at least the core of it, to slot between them. I was originally going to use brass rod for the axle, and you absolutely could, but honestly I found that skewers are pretty damn resilient, and a hell of a lot cheaper and easier to work with, so I cut a 4 inch piece of that to slot in. That said, I also wanted to hide the skewer texture and make the axle a little bit wider so the chain would wrap around it with less winching. That and I wanted to make the chain less likely to get caught. To do this I grabbed some serial card and cut a strip down to just under two and a quarter inches wide to fit between the I-beams and wrapped two layers around it around the skewer, super gluing it down each time. I found this was a bit easier if I rolled the card around a thick paintbrush first to give it a smooth curve and then super glued one end to the skewer before rolling it, cutting and gluing. This technique gave it some really trying to avoid the word girth. Additional diameter. I did this as two layers rather than one jam roly-poly, so I would have the ends of the cards line up rather than overlap. I intended to add some bolts to this later, but I forgot. Ah well, it's mostly hidden under the chin anyway. Now that's all very well and good, but it was looking a bit plain, and also a bit structurally unstable given how it was going to be lifting heavy objects. To counter that, I made some support I-beams from two layered pieces of chipboard, two inches tall and an eighth of an inch wide, enclosed by two more pieces of two inches tall and a quarter of an inch wide. Once I had those, I cut off the corners at a 45 degree angle, again on a cutting mat with angles helps here, and tacky glued them in place supporting the side I-beam on three sides. I also added a smaller one on the middle side, which was identical to the smaller ones that I made for the front winch, which I'll be showing in a minute. Now that looks stable. Still needs a bit more though, because raising and lowering the chain is one thing, but it needs to be able to raise and lower the crane arm, otherwise it can't change distance. To do this I built two smaller side I-beams in exactly the same way, just half an inch shorter. The support beams for this were also half an inch shorter, but otherwise were exactly the same as the main supports. And finally I added four inches of skewer, again wrapped in serial card, exactly the same as the other winch axle. Now we're getting there. Still just a base though. This crane needs an arm. To make the arm I started by making two I-beams using three layered five inch by quarter inch strips. Two of which I drilled a four millimeter hole through, a quarter of an inch from the end for a skewer, before gluing the third one on and rounding off the ends, exactly as I did for the side I-beams on the base. It's a good idea to drill a four millimeter hole through the bottom of the inner strips at this point too, a quarter of an inch from the edge to slot a skewer through. I did this after attaching the enclosing strips, but it's much harder to trim the excess card this way. This particular hole can be tighter around the skewer though, because it's going to be glued in place anyway. Then I sealed them up with two four and a half inch by three eighths of an inch enclosing strips all tacky glued together. I needed something to connect the arms, so I cut five of these support I-beams for the middle of the crane. They're basically the same as the angled support beams holding up the winch beams, but shorter, only three quarters of an inch long. I measured three quarter of an inch increments from the top on the inner edge of one of the I-beams and tacky glued these in place. Next I needed to work on the axles to slot between them at the top. Again, I grabbed some skewer and cut a one inch piece of that to slot in. I also layered on some serial card, exactly as before, but this time cut down to just under three quarters of an inch wide to fit between the I-beams. 
For the bottom, I cut a five inch bit of skewer and grabbed two one eighth of an inch wide strips and two one quarter of an inch wide strips, both three quarters of an inch long, exactly the same as used to make the arm connection beams and the angled support beams. I then glued these in place around the middle of the skewer, hiding it completely. Once all this was in place, I glued the arms together, connecting everything up on both sides and super gluing the skewer in place on the outside, before adding some more card strips around it to hide the rest of the skewer, this time 3 eighths of an inch long on each side. Speaking of that, connecting it to the base is pretty straightforward. I just made two half inch squares of eight layered chipboard and drilled a four millimeter hole through four of those layers and then glued the other four on the outer side before cutting the corners off to give them a nice angle. Once I had two of these, I super glued them to the front of the crane on each side with the crane arm attached in the holes. Then to hide the layers, I added a strip of serial card to perfectly cover the top. Next, I needed some way to control the descent of the chain so I could wind it up without holding it in place. I'll get to the actual chain later. It's easier to attach that last rather than having it dangling everywhere. To control the arm itself, the chains would be attached to the front winch, which as I decided to make a kind of wheel for. I say wheel, what I mean is octagon mainly because cutting circular objects smoothly and thick card at small scale without it fraying is challenging. To cut the octagon, I measured out one inch squares and then measured five sixteenths of an inch from each corner and joined them up. It's not a perfectly regular octagon, but it is close enough. Once I had those, I drilled a nice three millimeter hole through the middle of one so I could jam it onto the skewer and got to work on the mechanics of how this actually works. Which is, surprising no one, magnets. I cut two 3 8 of an inch pieces of chipboard and drilled a three millimeter hole through one of them in the middle and glued them together. Before gluing a three millimeter wide, two millimeter deep neomidium magnet in there. Check out my equipment list if you're not sure where to find these. Which way around you glue in the magnet doesn't matter, as long as you reference it when sticking the next ones into the wheel. I also cut the corners off to make it look a bit nicer when glued in. Once that was made, I glued it just under the skewer. This annoyed me a little bit because it's slightly exposed from the sides, but it was the only way to make it work at this stage without making the wheel even bigger, which I didn't want to do. At the end though, when painted, I barely noticed this difference. Now all I need is magnets in the wheel. To do this, I drilled similar three millimeter holes an eighth of an inch from the edge of four sides of the octagon and glued magnets in there. Now that I was ready, I got to work making the arms of the wheel. I decided to use some of this three millimeter hexagonal styrene rod, which is really useful stuff for detailing. And I've got links for where you can pick this up in my equipment list. It's not an Amazon link because as much as I appreciate the support from you guys, I don't want to link you to somewhere where it's overpriced. If you appreciate that sort of stuff, by the way, my Patreon is in the description if you want to say thank you. I cut four five eighths of an inch long pieces and super glued them in place, basically leaving space in the middle for the skewer. It's important to line up the wheel with the magnet in the eye beam before doing this and glue the arms on on the outside of the wheel. Once those were in place, I placed it on the skewer, cut it down so the skewer didn't stick out past the arms and then super glued the hell out of it to make sure it would stay in place. And then finally super glued the final octagon over the top, sealing the piece shut. And that's the arm control made. Now for the main chain controls. To add a similar system, I drew inspiration from real medieval cranes, which were often powered by giant hamster wheels that people walked in. And no, I'm not kidding. To get this done in a nice circle, I made some templates which are available for free to everyone. The links are on my Patreon page linked in the description and possibly at the top here. If you're looking for the templates at some point in the distant future, just filter the Patreon feed by downloads using the filters at the top. I used the templates to cut some pieces from chipboard. Over the course of the project, I found the best way to get a nice clean cut was to trim away the bulk of the card first and then make the final cut with a sharp blade, cutting away only thin strips, which is a lot easier as well as smoother. 
The inner piece was a three inch diameter circle, which I drilled three millimeter holes into at the center for the skewer and some more three millimeter holes, one quarter of an inch from the edges in eight opposing places for the magnets, though I installed those later. I then added a two and seven eighths of an inch circle to the inner piece, building outwards away from where I was going to connect it to the crane. I drilled the skewer hole through completely and the magnet holes I drilled ever so slightly into this piece, but being careful not to break through. That said, I did break through on one, but it's not a huge deal because it should get mostly covered. I did this because the magnets are slightly thicker than chipboard, and in this case, that causes a problem. By drilling slightly into the second piece, I could have the magnets flush with the edge, which is what I then did, super gluing them all in place facing the same way. While it was easy to work on, I then added some detailing with serial card to the inner side of the piece, basically covering up those magnet holes nicely. I could have added more detailing here, but I wanted to keep the piece smooth as it rotated, so there was as little as possible that could get caught as it turned. Again, I made some templates for this, which are also available for free on the Patreon page. Once this was complete, I cut out three half an inch octagons and drilled a three millimeter hole into two of them before gluing them together, and then glued them over the skewer hole on the outer side of the wheel. This was to give the skewer more to hold on to and to give a firmer hold. If you want to make sure these are lined up, you can just poke a skewer through when you're gluing the octagons in place. Now that was done, it was time to add the real structure of the wheel by wrapping one inch wide serial card around the smaller circle. I did this with super glue for the quick drying nature, but you could probably use hot glue because more of this will be covered by other pieces. So for once it's stringy messiness shouldn't be an issue. When that was in place, I added detailing with half an inch by one inch strips of serial card on the outside with small gaps in between, covering the connections and giving the wheel texture, and filled in the last gap with a trimmed down piece of serial card. I used super glue for this because it was a bit fiddly when using hot glue, and I wanted to get the glue right up to the edge, and well, it's called hot glue for a reason. I added a ton of bolts to these later, adding even more detailing. I then followed a pretty similar pattern on the inside, and then added an outer piece of chipboard, again cut from a template that sealed in those ugly edges of the serial card. The last step was to add a double layered 3 8 of an inch square with one drilled and a magnet glued in, just like the one that I glued onto the front winch. I measured an inch and 3 8 down from the skewer and aimed to glue the magnet over it. Getting it as close as possible is pretty important because the further away the magnet is, the weaker the bond will be. I realized this the hard way. Once this was done, I just super glued the wheel in place to the dowel. If I wanted to make the piece into a more futuristic machine, I could easily add a removable side piece by adding magnets on the inside of this outer circle of chipboard and gluing some other circles of chipboard together with magnets drilled in and techy looking bits attached to the outside. My bits box is in a state of rebuilding at the moment though, so I left that for now. Completely easy for you to do though. Right, time to bring it all together with the chains. I picked up this very nice looking aged bronze colored jewelry chain, three millimeters by two millimeters. I've linked it in my equipment list for the UK at least. The really nice thing about this is that I don't need to spray it first to dull it down as I've done in previous builds, so I was able just to attach it with some wire loops which I bent around the winches to get a stronger hold and cut off the excess. From there I just wrapped chain around it until I thought it looked awesome. Then I trimmed it and looped a magnet piece to the end. To make this magnet piece I drilled a hole for the magnet into some triple stacked chipboard again and drilled some smaller holes to loop wire through, super gluing it all in place before trimming the corners to make the shape a bit more interesting. To make the cargo platform, I first tried making another magnetic piece from three quarters of an inch square of chipboard with a magnet drilled in and the corners cut off. I then drilled through the corners of two two inch square pieces of chipboard with the corners cut very slightly at the edges and wire loops added to each with an even amount of chain hung between them, just enough to fit some of my taller models. I made those wire loops by bending aluminium wire around a skewer, which gave a nice tight curve. Then I glued the magnetic piece on top. 
and realised that the floor was then as unstable as hell and would tip in any direction. So I decided it was time to add more chains. I added four more chains to the top two inch piece, ending in a magnetic piece that was pretty much identical to the one on the bottom of the chain, but obviously with the magnetic pole facing the other way around so it would attach. This gave the piece way more stability and balance and meant you could put pretty much anything on the platform without it tipping off. The rest of the chains I added after painting because I realised I was going to spray this bloody thing. The arm I added two chains to, one on each side which were bolted to the winch, on each side too with more wire loops drilled and superglued in place. On all of these pieces I added probably way more chain than was needed because one, it looks cool, and two, it gave me the freedom to use it as high as I wanted in the future with no issues. At this stage I also added a counterweight system to the back, which was really simple. Just a 2 inch by 1 inch box of chipboard with coins inside of them. I added some serial card strips for decoration, but that was about it. Now I have the crane nice and functional, and that's all very well and good as long as I only want to pick things up and put things down in one direction. But that's pretty silly, so I got to work on a rotating base. I put together some nice easy templates to make this much easier, which again are free for everyone on my Patreon linked in the description. These are all labelled in order so you know which ones you need gluing on top of each other. Getting them in the exact centre isn't important, as long as they are roughly lined up. I started off by cutting out and gluing the bottom three layers, before filling the gap that they created with two layers of 2p coins to give the base some weight. If you're not in the UK, you can use whatever low value coins you have locally, or you can just use washers or something like that. I then sealed it with the fourth layer. Once that was nice and weighty, I added the fifth layer, and cut out some 2 inch by one half an inch strips, cut some pointy ends into them and glued them pointing into the centre before hiding away the outer edges with the sixth and final layer. Then I just cut out two one and a half inch octagons using the same method that I showed before, except in this one I measured in seven sixteenths of an inch from each corner for cutting off the corners. I drilled in a three millimetre hole into the centre of both and super glued another three millimetre magnet into each. I glued one of these into the centre of the base and the other beneath the middle of the crane, south side facing down for consistency with the magnets in more of my pieces. If you're not sure what I mean here, you probably haven't seen any of my other pieces, in which case south side doesn't really matter yet and you can figure this out later. I added some more half inch octagons to the outer edges of the underside of the piece, simulating their connection to the outer edge of the base. And that's pretty much it for the base, which means I can now rotate my crane. Awesome. Now comes the bit that brings the piece to life, adding as many bolts and screws as I can fit on the damn thing. Now for my previous projects I've used a technique of dabbing Mod Podge to create a raised rounded bolt appearance, but for this piece I wanted bigger bolts and more detail, so I grabbed some more of those hexagonal styrene rods from my local model shop. You can get these online too, and there are some links in my equipment list. Now these are amazing for adding detail because of their complex structure but ease of use. Literally all you have to do is cut little chunks off the end of the rod, and then just super glue them on carefully with a cocktail stick and some blue tack, and you have an awesome looking bolt. For the thicker rods, to get a straight cut, I found it can be useful to cut it halfway through, and then rotate it 90 degrees and cut again, using the first cut as a guide to keep things straight. You can also mix and match smaller round rods with a larger hex rod to give the look of a nut screwed onto the end of a bolt. Most of the bolts I used were a mix of 3mm and 4mm hex rods, with a few 2mm circular rod pieces here and there.
Painting it was surprisingly straightforward, though at first I needed to seal up those card edges so that they wouldn't fray with use. I did this using a mix of Mod Podge and black paint. Now I made sure not to thin it down very much, but it does need a splash of water on each brush load just to smooth out the flow and make sure you don't end up with thick brush strokes everywhere. If I was doing this again, honestly I'd probably use this mixture carefully on the edges of the frayable card edges only and then leave most of the primer ring to the spray. The difficulty of reaching certain areas with a brush led to me being a little bit rougher here than I probably should have been, so the piece probably would have come out better if I'd done this. Once I'd done a layer with my bigger brush, I went back with a smaller one and got into all the nooks and crannies. With all of that sealed, I gave it a quick spritz with black rattle can primer just to make sure it had the best and smoothest undercoat I could get, before spraying it again with a metallic spray, in this case GW Ironbreaker. I very cleverly attached the chain before spraying, so I covered it as best I could with masking tape before spraying it. This gave a fantastic base to work from and took away a lot of the grind of painting. Most of what I did from here was detail work and washes, starting by adding a touch of colour with this gorgeous iridescent bronze acrylic that I've had lying around for ages. And some GW Warplock bronze, or tin bits as I refuse to stop calling it. If you're an old school Warhammer nerd you know what I'm talking about. I base coated some areas in a few places scattered around the piece in dark brown as a base coat. I tried to keep them spread out to add colour in a balanced way and not have it feel oddly lopsided from a colour's perspective. I then added the iridescent bronze to areas that I considered more decorative, like the handles on the small wheel, the end caps on the sides of the winch axles, the outer plates of the large wheel, and the bindings on the counterweight at the back. For more functional areas like the winch axles and the lowest areas of the base, I added tin warplock bronze. I also added warplock in the recesses between the bronze plates of the human hamster wheel. I initially tried pin washing the bolts, keeping the majority of the piece unwashed, both to save on wash and to preserve that metallic shine. When it was done though, I wasn't happy with the smooth finish of the result. It looked too clean. So I went back and covered everything but the chain in black wash with army paint a dark tone, drawing the wash towards the bolts and crevices and allowing it to settle, giving it some more shading. I chose to use mini paints for this, mainly because it feels more like a large mini than small terrain to me. I decided against weathering effects like rust and other oxidization in the end, because I'm tempted to go back and redo this paint job at a later stage, and adding textured effects is somewhat final. I hope you guys got some good ideas or inspiration from this build. I think builds like this with moving parts can do a lot to inspire the child within all of us and just give us something to play with. As usual, let me know what you guys think in the comments. I love to hear from you guys and thank you to everyone who has shared any of my videos or has mentioned me in Facebook comments or anything like that. I really appreciate you sharing the channel around. If you enjoy these videos that I work on for you guys every week and you want to help me keep making them, the best way you can help me do that is by joining me in the archive on Patreon. By doing that you gain access to a few different things, one of which is a vote on which projects you guys would like to see next and you can influence what comes up sooner rather than later. Most importantly though, you guys will be helping me continue to bring tutorials like this out for free to most people. Finally, if you need any tools or supplies for your builds, as always, there is a link in the description to my equipment list, which contains everything that I use and where to get it from. 
and if you buy it from an Amazon link within that link then there will be a small amount that comes from the purchase, no extra cost to yourself to support the channel, which is kind of cool. Thank you guys for watching, I'll be back next week with another cool build. Until next time, I'll be in the archive.